Um, thank you, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the floor. Honorable Speaker, I would like to thank the Vice President and the entire Cabinet for being with us since yesterday to debate on SON. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I for one, I believe we need to adopt democratic principles in order, in order to give our parliament uh, a good face in terms of parliamentary practices. In that, the president tasks us as a parliament to be able to serve our country and to promote democratic values. In that, what this parliament would love to see and that it has never seen in the history, that is to have their leader in their midst to be talking on issues and that's going to promote the relationship between us and our leader. We have been, we have been advocating that. Vice presidents will come, ministers will come. Yes, we have no doubt in their ability. But we want our president to sit with the NAMS to discuss issues so that this is going to be direct communication. Sometimes we believe along the line our message are not filtered as supposed to be. Sometimes we believe that the president should feel our, fearing, our, our feelings. So in that, it's going to promote our democracy. During Jawara's days, it never happened. Jaya Jambe came for 22 years, it never happened. So that's going to be his legacy and our legacy. And I think everybody should be ready to promote that. Honorable Speaker, going to the main discussion. Um, the financial condition of this country is going down due to a lot of factors. Though the president based his speech centered on Ukraine war and COVID-19. That's evident. But I believe we have some internal problems as far as the revenue collection is concerned. So it will be the duty of all of us, particularly those who are given the tax, the responsibility, to make sure that the leakages are sealed. Every year, uh, every day, we look at social media, you hear a lot of things that's not helping the country. Because Gambia is not an island, and we entirely depend on donor support. If they are seen corruption, working naked in institutions or hearing about it, that can stop them to fund some of the project. And it's going to affect us. So it's high time we hold the bull by the horn and let justice prevail. Our institutions that are raising revenue for the country must be ready to fight or combat corruption. Honorable Speaker, Uh, coming to national development plan, uh, the, the debt that we have, both national and international, um, we all know that countries are indebted, not only Gambia. But what do we do? How do we make investment to make sure that the productive services are well positioned to yield something for the country? If not, the debt services will increase. Our agriculture, yes, we talk about food security, but the agriculture should boost our economy. We should not only depend on groundnut for our exportation. We should go beyond that. The vegetables that are grown in this country, a lot of them go in waste. We can make a lot of foreign exchange out of that. So it's high time we try to reduce uh, the debt services by investing into the economy. Honorable Speaker, uh, coming to a public-private partnership, uh, anywhere you have partnership, you want it to be mutualistic. You want, we don't want it to be symbiotic relations. So um, in partnering with relevant uh, uh, corporate societies or private sectors, it needs to strengthen our economy. It needs to support us, but instead, they will loot us or depend on us to enrich themselves at the end of the day. We should fight against that. In as much as we want to promote 
public-private partnership, care must be taken. We must know what is our interest. Honorable Speaker, moving to foreign affairs, international cooperation and Gambians abroad. Um, the President made mention of some of the achieve achievements made and which we should not lose sight of those uh, significant achievements. But I think there is much to be desired. The foreign services need to be really looked at. Who are the people that we are sending to this foreign service? What can they bring to our country? I think the president should tell us, 2016 to date, or last year to date, what we are some of the flagship projects brought by these foreign services. We are spending a lot on them. What are they bringing to the country? We really need to look at this. Honorable Speaker, um, it's not every Tom and Harry that needs to be deployed to foreign service. We don't want people who will just there to receive their salaries and allowances. They must promote the image of this country. They must have the concern of Gambians outside. Honorable Speaker, our brothers are living outside and sisters, but they are not even given their democratic right to participate in voting in this country. And we talk a lot about the diasporians, the contribution that they made, remittances that they send, but they are not given franchise to vote. I think henceforth we need to look at that as a government. How do we incorporate, how do we give chance to our people to participate in our elections? Honorable Speaker, coming to agriculture, um, the President made mention of 20 boholes for small ruminants across the country. 20 bohol drill. For next sauna, we would like to know the location of these boholes, where they are dug in within the country. Because if it is my constituency centered by the book, I can tell the President or I can tell the August Gathering whether you know, it's completed or not. What are these levels of implementation? So members attend here can be witness to some of the projects. And, Honorable Speaker, some of these projects will come to our areas. And the President said, we, you know, we come as one family and develop the country. But those that are not in the President's party will not be part of the discussions, will not be part of the need assessment, will not be part of the project implementation. That culture must be stopped if we want to be a serious people, to develop a serious country. Representative of the people must be respected in their communities. They should be the gateway. So when partners come to implement a particular project in Central Badibu, I should be consulted, no matter what. And if the president is coming to launch that project, I should be consulted. Because I should be there. If you don't see me there, they say, ah, this man, they don't like the president. No, that culture must be stopped. If you don't inform me, I will not go. My grandfather said, if you are not invited to a program, if you touch their egg, you will be held responsible. So let's, let it be inclusive as people who are ready to mean their words. Honorable Speaker, I have a report here. I saw a youth man standing in a field. Yes, but these photos are not enough to represent the youth fraternity in their involvement in agriculture. How many young people do we have in the rural Gambia who are trying to participate effectively in, in crop production, but they don't have support? The way the funds come, the way the projects are implemented, youths are not involved. We use the youths, youths and women to get funds. When, they get, when we get the funds, we marginalize them. This is the culture that must be stopped in our agriculture. We always say they are the cream of the society. They are the backbone of the society. When the project comes, it's Alcalo and some of the VDC that will be seen. The VDC or the Alcalo will select his family members to be part of the project. That culture must be stopped. Honorable Speaker, we have the vegetable growers there. The pito is good. I don't know whether it's funny or what. But I believe this is a um, NEMA project. The photos. Okay, now we have roots. We should be informed the transition from NEMA to roots. 
If we are not informed on the transition, we will not know what went well and what went wrong with root, uh, with name of projects. Now we have roots. The same problem can happen. And these vegetable growers, they don't have market. There is a, uh, there is a missing link between production and marketing. More so processing. So our agriculture must have a link. If there is no link in agriculture from production to processing and marketing, then what kind of value are we adding to our agriculture? It's still the prototype system of agriculture that prevails in the Gambia since the days of our grandfathers. We need to move. Somebody made mention of tractors, yes, in the, in the, in the Second Republic. And he said the tractors were... Uh, it is a very nice language. Um, huh? I don't know sincerely. I, I, I wrote it somewhere. But um, the, the, tractors, the distribution of... Yes, can you help me? Thank you. Uh, uh, the tractors were taken and they sold them and they distribute the money among themselves. Thank you. From poor innocent Gambian farmers. Thank you. You can continue. Uh, but that's not what I'm looking for. What I'm actually looking for, he said, uh, the tractors we are giving to seasoned farmers. I will not call them seasoned farmers. I will call them as political patronage. The tractors we are giving to the chiefs, the alcalos, the governors, who we are the ambassadors of politics in those days, and which we need to change the narrative now. If we condemn, we, we confiscated those tractors, and the tractors are not given back to farmers that are serious, but instead being sold, that also should be condemned in totality. I was not happy during those days. Observation. How they were. Observation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the narrative is from me, and I think I should uh, observe you. Uh, what I said is very clear. As you have alluded, <clears throat> these are seasonal farmers that I can attest, uh, where uh, most of those areas where tractors were distributed were not chiefs. We are people who had seasonally farmed in my constituencies, the LR, the CRR, you name them. So it was never given to chiefs for political gain. Point of correction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I still maintain my stand that those people are not serious seasoned farmers. It will be wrong to tell us that they are seasoned farmers. And I want you to go to your dictionary and find out what we mean by seasoned farmers. My brother. Those are political patronage, and I'm going to repeat it. In my constituency, chiefs and politicians were given the tactics. I still maintain my point. We can continue the debate after the House. Honorable Mayor. Agriculture, we move to environment. Honorable Speaker, um, the Honorable Minister of Environment, the former Minister and the former Minister of Petroleum, they all came to this parliament here. I raised the issue of Tembilan and I raised the issue of sign mining taken at Saro, Benton Bridge. But they were trying to defend it here in the National Assembly, which even if you are not a geologist, you don't know anything about soil management. You know what is happening in Denton Bridge is not environmental friendly. The sand mining taking place in Denton Bridge, Honorable Speaker, it's high time the President know the damage that is causing to our environment. The Tambi Forest help Banjul, help our, 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 our aquatic animals to, 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 to do well in those environments. The feces in the river, that's their habitat, that's where they breed. All is now demolished in the name of expansion, in the name of building structures. We need to do proper environmental uh, assessment. And I put this to them. They say they have done environmental assessment. But even if they have done so, but what we are seeing now is not favorable. And the blame game was, it was the former government that allocated the land. We believe that the government remains. People come and go. 
If you come as a government and you find something that is, is troubling the environment, you need to take action. How many timber was exported from Gambia to outside? We know how our environment was damaged. We cannot just go and gather youths and women, tree planting. No, we must, we must move from tree planting to tree growing and tree protection. We must make sure that when we engage in tree growing, those trees need to be supported. We need to think dry season, what will happen to them? You cannot just go to the Dobo forest and say, we are planting trees. You take photos and send it to uh, Facebook or to your page. Oh, they, they inform state house that this is what we have. But do we have a sustainable scheme to make sure that those plants are protected? Because we, we invest in them. This is what is happening. The, 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 there are a lot of projects that came here. You know, CRR, URL. But go there and make an assessment and see whether those trees are in fact there. And, and I want to talk about the mangrove plantation that they are doing. Honorable Speaker, we, or most of us hail from rural Gambia and we have river right. Uh, the mangrove that they are planting in the upper land is not suitable in that land and they will never grow tall because mangroves always they are along the creeks. Do you understand? So the salt water or the fresh water will help them to grow. But if you put it in an open place or the upland, they will not grow well because they will not have enough water. So what, what happened? They will become dwarfs. If you look at all the trees, uh, all the mangroves being planted five years ago, they still remain as dwarfs because it's not the proper site for them. We need to do a lot of studies into this. Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, um, our environment is threatened and we need to look at the, our coastal line. The, the sand collection that is taking place is causing more harm than good. The government must think of alternative means of construction rather than we depend entirely on, on sand. Honorable Speaker, coming to health. Um, yes. Some MPs applauding the ministry for the ambulances. Fine, it's good. But my constituency is not the need at the time. I made an assessment with the then minister. We walk from help post to a help post up to 3 a.m. If easy, I is my living witness. And he consulted the grassroots. They told him their needs at their health facilities. I told him here during the days, I said, if my ambulance money could be, you know, used for drugs or rehabilitating my structures, I would prefer that. And this is what the assessment that I have done with him. But now the ambulance is given. Fuel is a problem. The driver issue is there. So these are some of the issues we have to be realistic in planning. And need assessments must be done. We cannot just say, I'm going to give ambulance to Sally Kenyi. When actually there is an ambulance that can serve something. When ambulance is not the need at the time. Maybe Nyanija or Upper Salo, ambulance is your need. It's your felt need. But for me, it's not my felt need. So we have to look at these things properly in order for development to be sustainable. Honorable Speaker, coming to um, health insurance scheme and bad registers, I think we have to applaud the government. For the giant step taken to standardize our data-based system. Honorable Speaker, if our data is not competed well, where do we move? Many people will talk on radio, social medias, you know, foreigners, this and that. No. When we have a data in place, we are secure as a country. So, but people who are refusing to get registered, I'm telling all of them to go and get registered because it will haunt you. When the system is closed, it will be very difficult to get another bad registration. So this is a national exercise. Everybody must be registered to have a correct data for our country. The health insurance scheme is another thing. People need to be informed. Honorable Speaker, it's not that today you are registered with the scheme, today you have the benefit. No. The program, 
the, the program is not officially started. Registration is taking place. Let's get registered. And it should be clear that it's not only Gambians. Even non-Gambians are entitled to health insurance. Communication must be done, Honorable Speaker. I believe communication was not properly channeled before the whole exercise was started. Because there were a lot of misinformation that went around. Honorable Speaker, coming to health personnel. Um, health personnel need to be motivated very well. And we need to look at their conditions, particularly in the rural Gambia. These people, they sacrifice a lot. They are everything in the communities. Do we know some, there is a gap in terms of training. Training gap also need to be looked at. But the sacrifice that they are making was commendation. And we need to see how best their allowances reach to them on time. Because teachers can go on strike, sit down strike, but if nurses go on strike, doctors go on strike, that's a different thing. So we really need to look at um, the training gap, they need to be capacitated, and, and we make sure that they get their juice on time. Honorable Speaker, coming to higher education and science, research, science and technology, I have to thank that ministry very well for the effort done in the fifth legislature. And also members will say that fifth legislature, they don't do nothing. Yes, we don't do nothing, but come and do something. We appreciate it. Yes, I know some are here now, they will do something. But that ministry took a giant step to address the problem at the University of the Gambia. When we are coming, the work progress was very low. With consultation, the ministry makes sure that the areas the funding issues we are addressed. More so scholarship. And it was through this parliament that supported the ministry so that we award more scholarship to our deserving students. Kudos to the Ministry of Higher Education for that effort. And how many young women and men are now going to university from bachelor's to master's degree. But I have to express my disappointment too about Ndemban, Ndemban Skills Center, Honorable uh, Speaker. Uh, Ndemban Skills Center, we went there, there are a lot of investment made. And I believe the President will in fact make mention of it in the speech. The progress, how far? Because we thought by now, students should be going to Ndemban to learn skills. The investment there should not be wasted. I know there are other consultations done, but now we want to see action by now. But I think the, honor, uh, the Vice President will be in the better position to inform this House as far as Demban is concerned. Because I believe the entire youths from North Bank, Sierra, even if we can have, we cannot have thousands, but we can have, a, we can have at least 700 students or more that can attend that skill center. So, Honorable Speaker, I believe the Vice President will better inform the office about Ndemban. Honorable Speaker, I think TVEC education also is in high gear and in high direction, but we need to also decentralize skills. Um, if you walk through the North Bank region, before we have technical schools, schools that do technical education, but we need to have institutions that will you know, provide skill training, not only GTTI or not only in the greater Banyu. So sometimes we feel marginalized, those from the rural Gambia, to be honest, because we want to see some of these skills also in our communities, in our environment, that will also mitigate the level of rural urban migration. Why do we leave the rural area and come to the urban area? It's because of in search of skills, education, or job. So once we have it in the rural Gambia, that's also going to reduce our urban population in increase. Honorable Speaker, I'm proud to tell you people that uh, we attended a training in South Africa, Midran, where Gambia was singled up in terms of Tibet education. 
the achievements made by the government that we have a woman in the Gambia who is a specialist in auto mechanic. The whole, the whole sub-region Gambia was singled out. So I'm proud to inform this office that as far as civil education is concerned, as far as skill is concerned, Gambia is in move. But as I said, we need more expansion in this area because um, not everybody will go in academics and we need to fill these gaps. Honorable Speaker, looking at the examination results, I know some will say students are failed. But for me, I will not call it a failure, being an educationist. Um, I believe the curriculum needs to be revisited. Honorable Speaker, I want the Vice President to note that Gambia, we, our curriculum needs to be revisited. Our curriculum should not be based on meritism, you know, but it should be tailored in a way that we learn to serve communities. We learn to serve our industries. We learn to provide skills. If it is only examination oriented, then we fail as a country. Honorable Speaker, from education, coming to petroleum, uh, the President made mention of FAR and Petronas successfully completing the drilling of Bamboo One in December 2021. This is an offshore exploration. Well, what happened next? We need to be informed if they have been successfully exploring Bamboo One in 2021, December, up to now. What do we need to know? I think, I believe there is missing information. You know, um, and this drilling also, the assembly need to be well informed. We know little about what is happening. I know the committees are engaging them, but as far as the General Assembly is concerned, we need more information on the drilling that is taking place in order to diffuse some of the information that are circulated. Honorable Speaker, uh, coming to Navek, the OMVG is another flagship project that was commendation, and I believe there is a, a progress register in it. But Honorable Speaker, looking at the Gambia, coming back to rural Gambia, there are communities who are still suffering, who don't have access to electricity. And this is their fundamental right. Before I mention Panchang, I will mention Kerepati in Central Baribu, then coming to Panchang then. So these are communities that you know, they have lumos, there is local market going on. Once there is electricity in those communities, the, the economy can go up. It can grow up, trade could be easily facilitated, they can be engaged in a lot of things. We know it's in phases, but these areas need serious uh, electricity because they see themselves marginalized in the, in the, in the development. Honorable Speaker from Jawara, traveling to the northern part of central Baribu to Mintekunda, that belt never enjoyed electricity. And there are, there are tax compliance, they are the supporters of the government, they do a lot. But since time in memorial, they don't know what is electricity. It's Senegal who is you know, bringing cold water to them uh, for sale. So imagine. So these are some of the things that the government need to really look into. Tourism. Honorable Speaker, um, tourism, I am disappointed, seriously disappointed with that ministry. Um, this National Assembly approved funds for ecologies to be constructed within the country. And those ecologies, there is no life existing there. What is the ministry doing? about it. We all know that COVID-19 hit that ministry a lot. But we believe there can be something that we do 
rather than having this phobia of COVID-19 in our minds. And more so, I had, a, I had an information from that ministry, they released an information that all British women come here for sex tourism or they, that's too segregatory, that's too bad for our tourism. That communication was very poor. I don't expect a responsible institution to make such relief. Those women, they have right to marry anybody, even if it's their fundamental right to marry to anybody. We always talk about human rights, and marriage is a human right. It's choice. You are not there to tell me the wife that I should marry. You are not there to tell me. And if you look at a particular country and label them of that, are you not killing your tourism industry? Can we speak a point of order? Can we hear the point of order? Standing order section 31 stated very clear. And I think the member is deviating from the point that we're discussing. Specifics should be on the state of nation address. And I think you need to concentrate on that. 31. Yeah, yes, I, I, I've looked at it. I think this has been the same point of order yesterday and today. And uh, I mean, as regards, he was talking about tourism and uh, sex tourism and people's right to marry. I think those are those are captured in the in the in the in the in the whole statement of the His Excellency the President. What I would advise honourable members to do is, if you are not of the opinion as to what he says, take the floor and come out with an opinion. Honourable member, can you continue, please? Thank you, honourable speaker. I'm never distracted. I'm so what I what I said, you want me to repeat it, and I will repeat it. I'm not happy with the statement because we are here to heal a nation, and we want to promote tourism. I'm saying certain remarks, whether you are a minister, whether you are a honourable. You should be responsible in our remarks, Honorable Member of Olyulu. This is my point. All right, Honorable Speaker, going further. Um, museum. Um, we all know that our artifacts, our history, should be well kept in our museum. I believe the President should inform us. Is the government in position to look at our museum, particularly the one in Banjo, expanding it, digitalize our, 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 our records, and you know, for, for, for rural Gambia also to have some of this museum, because there are a lot of artifacts that are getting lost. And if you go to the museum here, there is much to be desired there, to be honest. We, I think we believe as a country and as a member of African Union, since agenda 2063 is working towards how to make sure that our heritage, our cultures are promoted. Honorable Speaker, coming to gender, women and children, this is our brainchild, this parliament, this ministry that you see. Honorable Speaker, we develop a bill. We have a success story of the disability bill, which the President made mention. Uh, we want to thank the ministry for their co collaboration and the parliament. You know, all, um, Chinua Achebe once said, when an Agaman lizard fall down from an Iroko tree, he said, if, if people don't praise him, he will praise himself. So this parliament needs to celebrate and praise themselves because those bills all pass through this parliament. The disability bill, the support, the engagements, the consultations. But Honorable Speaker, coming to the Women Enterprise Fund, we have a disappointment. And the, the principle of that fund is to support Gambian women. And I believe the President will be happy when women group who are not in his party to get benefit. But we have seen, we have evidences where checks are used, are issued on political platforms. Yes, I have evidence. 
it's evident you know it was it was it was it was it was done we made an alert we have evidence by then as a select committee to call the minister to order but what i'm saying is when something come as nation builders let us make sure that let us make sure that we separate politics from our development because we have been taxed by the president to cooperate fully for the development to take place. I will not cooperate if marginalization is seen naked in my face. I will not compromise. So for that, I think that was a gross error that we need to look at. For future, let us separate politics with our development. What comes for women, let women, women kafos be given because the criteria are very clear for those who, are, who will be qualified for it. Honorable Speaker, coming to um, coming to the same gender and women, I saw a photo on, in this report, very interesting. A woman holding two cattle. That shows that how women also are supported in small ruminant or or or. or or in agriculture. But I believe it's beyond this. It's beyond this. And the ministry must make sure that women are not used. But they must take the lead. They must take the lead. The world we live in, I said it here, we have weed what now is God. Gender and development. So let's make sure that whatever is done to women, let women, men also be. If not, this country will go again to take men and bring them. And we don't have time for that. So let's all go alongside and make sure that these projects are supported and protected. It's all based on how we, we implement them. Honorable Speaker, youths and sports. Honorable Speaker, I think this ministry needs to be separated. Because when you say sports, many people have this feeling that Youths are only, it's only meant for sport. And I think youth development is beyond sport. Though sport is an integral part of it. Honorable Speaker, our youths are not supported. They are. We commonly say youths are lazy, they don't want to work. No. It's the system. And those youths at the beach side, it's high time. This parliament, look at them. Don't look at the dreadlocks that they carry. They are decent human beings that live, that need a life that's worth of, you know, celebrating. They are contributing something to the society. Let us not marginalize them. They are our brothers. Whether you like it or not, they come from families. Let's meet them in their ghettos. We must communicate to them. Let's look at the institution of bumsterism and see how to make sure that it's, it's, it's recognized. The bumsters, the people that we call bumsters, let's look at them. These are people that ministry, uh, the government need to look at. These are critical group of people living in somewhere. Maybe, you know, sometimes we feel not to go and see how they live. I think it's good for every minister or an MP to take a stroll around the Senegambia in the evening and see for yourself. This group of people, it's high time we look at them, how to make sure that we have a uh, uh, better measures for them, Honorable Speaker. They can be very useful in, our, in, our, in some of the industries, not only in the, in the hotel industry. Honorable Speaker, youth and employment. It will be very difficult for all, all of us to put on tie to go to the office. But if a youth is supported in CRR with the necessary tools, he is employed. And let us not try to misdefine employment. Employment doesn't mean where you will be paid 3000 or 5000 No. You can employ yourself. It's not only on the suit that will solve this, solve, solve this problem. But people need to be empowered. Youth must be recognized. And when you come to sports, I will repeat it. The traditional wrestling is dying in the country. Nyoborumo is, is, is getting fed up. Fed up. So we have to look at 
other sports that are so much cultural oriented. Not Barcelona and Manchester. <laughs> or Real Madrid. No. It's beyond that. Thank you. Onyaniya. Honorable Speaker, um, I believe with the support to the youths, they can do, they can change the narrative. And it's high time. Those who call themselves youths, and you are not a youth. In our rural Gambia also, please leave the field. There is a time for you can become a youth advisor. But you cannot be a youth when you are 45, 50 years. Youth projects will come in the village. You champion them, you abuse them, and put it in your pocket. It's, 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 this is the fight that I'm doing in Central Baribu. And I believe all of us can do in our constituencies. Let's get involved in the youth activities. We coach them, let them have their constitution. Let us make sure that the leadership is taken by the right youth. And more so in the political parties. The political parties, you, fi you find old people, gray hairs, calling themselves youths. Sambajalo and others. No, you must live. You are not a youth. You leave the youth domain and go to other domains. But the example must start from us. Honorable Speaker, coming to the office of the Vice President, disaster. Honorable Speaker, I think we need a national framework for disaster. And which has to be coordinated. Um, this framework will comprise all the institutions that are disaster related. Honorable Speaker, are we safe? That, that is the problem there. Are you afraid? Okay. Honorable Speaker, um, when COVID-19 came, I can stand here and say the whole Africa was not prepared. We are not prepared as a continent. We are not prepared as a country. And who knows what is coming next? We cannot wait until disaster occurs. We start looking for funds. Some are sent, giving t-shirts, you know, mattresses. You call that one uh, respond to disaster? No. Honorable Speaker, this institution should not only focus on floods or houses that are falling down. It's beyond that. I believe um, it has to be coordinated to make sure that we know that these are natural things that will happen along the line. But once we are organized, once we have good budgetary allocation for disasters, when disaster occurs, we can respond immediately. If not, it's the MPs who will suffer. And MPs don't have budget for disaster. The councils must be responsible. It's not only the central government. Area councils, they are collecting taxes. What are they doing? We need to know whether they have a budget for disaster. It's not only to go and say a mayor or a councillor came to see us. No. Seeing me empty-handed as a body bunker, I will ask you to go. I will not in fact welcome you. So these are some of the things when people are need, the institutions responsible must act. Honorable Speaker, um, coming to infrastructure and communication, um, we believe there is work, there is a lot of work done in the last five years as far as road constructions are concerned. We might call it political like some of us critics, yes, but um, definitely I think Hakalang was a right conceit project. And Opa Salung, Nyangaba Road, Sabasanjali, Nyanija, Sabasanjali, Bambali. Honorable Speaker, coming to Hakala, the work progress in Hakala, we need to know the percentage of progress. How far? Sabasanjali, we need to be informed. Because these are projects that all pass through this parliament. We do not know where they are now, what are their challenges, and what can this parliament do. Once we are better informed, we can make a better decision during budget allocation. But the information that we get here, as far as those projects are concerned, 
there are not enough for the parliament to make a better decision. Some of those roads are in a horrible condition. And they have a, they have a target. They have a target. So we need to be better informed as far as those infrastructures are concerned. Honorable Speaker, um, looking at my own area, the Pani Selikenya Road, the project is standard, awarded. We believe the work should start by now. We believe. So such kind of pending projects, the Kiangas also, I know they will have their own stories to tell, but the Kia Road also, these are some of the roads that we need to know. The assembly needs to be informed on the progress level of those roads. Farato Jambur, we don't know. This parliament, we don't know where the fund comes from, who is sponsoring that road. We know nothing about that road. As the former chair of the committee, we know nothing. We, up to now, we don't know who are sponsoring that road. And it's in a horrible condition. We must be serious. You cannot fix a road today. One more time, you go there, you cannot ply the road. Let any MP try from Farato Market to Jambul. You will see what is happening. And this are taxpayers' money. So, if you want us to work, well, it has to be a coordinated team play. I do my, you do yours. We can't allocate funds, and next minute, we see you doing something different. And when they come here, we are the people that they see, please pass this thing, please pass this thing. You could, we, could, we could all remember when that oil fund came from BP. Ministers, we are parading here, all lobbying for their ministries to be allocated. So once we allocate, we make sure we do it as allocated. Honorable Speaker, um, defense and security. Honorable Speaker, I think most of the members speak about it. And last parliament, the, the, the clerk will bear me witness. I raise matters of the day as far as security issue is concerned, particularly to foreign troops in our land, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I for one, I believe it's time for economy to leave our country for good. It's costly, Honorable Speaker. It's high time our men to be in charge. What, have, what is happening to security sector reform? We believe by now, once the reform is done, we should be the masters of our own destiny. We know Gambia is not an island. We are part of ECOWAS. And we knew why they came at the time it was needed. We are in a political impasse at the time. But once we were here for five years, we went for election, we have another badge of government, sound-minded ministers that we think they can steer the wheel, sound-minded norms. So what next now? What next now? Do we mean the employment that we have done, the, the elections that we have done? Are we not really in what we are doing? Change must happen now. Our security cannot be in control of foreigners. We don't have an occupation here. And we have to learn history. Before 1994, what happened in this country? There were Nigerian troops here. In this country. Do you understand? So, it is a transition. We must... Wait. You want to observe me? Honorable Speaker. Uh, I just want to, after uh, Suleiman's presentation, to move a motion. Uh, we, we limit time. After his presentation, we limit each member's time to probably 10. Otherwise, I see some members sleeping already. So I think 10, 15 minutes will be okay for, for each member. Okay. Um, I think you, are, uh, you, you have observed me. Huh? Okay, so it's, it's, it's noted. Let's move. Honorable Speaker, um, what I'm saying is um, we want our men in uniform to be in charge. We want them to be in charge. 
we, we have no hatred for um, Senegalese troop or Nigerian troop or Ghanaian troop in the Gambia, but we believe Gambia as a sovereign country. We have our laws, we have our military, we have our securities. They need to act as a country. That's my observation, and I believe um, you will carry it to the president that time has come for us to be in charge. Honorable Speaker, um, justice delay is justice denied, coming to legal sector. And we believe the president made mention of TRC. Now, TRC is something that has been constituted by this parliament, by an act of parliament. And we believe it was a process. Now, the white paper has to be implemented. And we need the support of everybody. We are not here to put up a blame game. But I, for one, believe we all have a responsibility to carry. And in that responsibility, we have to do it judiciously. Now, you cannot ask me to forget about the past when justice is not given. We believe this matters the process needs to be completed until those found guilty we know that they are guilty then we can talk of forgiveness and we can reconcile but once the process is not completed honorable speaker unity in this country will be threatened and it will be very difficult for us to develop this nation so we must make sure that the process is complete and this parliament have a role to play as far as the TRRC white paper implementation is concerned. Let's stand firm to see to read that the people, the perpetrators are prosecuted. At the end of the day, we talk of forgiveness and reconciliation. But we must see justice being done. Justice needs to be done and seen to be done. Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, at the early days of the government, 2016, we talk of sanitizing our judiciary for the, for the judiciary to be Gambianized, Honorable Speaker. And we have seen the government taking right steps. We thank them for the step taken to make sure that the born, uh, our own grown-up Gambians take the lead in our judiciary than the mercenary judges from outside the country. And I think we have to commend the government for that. But I believe still, you know, we need to do more as far as our courts are concerned. The cases, you know, that are happening in our courts, sometimes they are, they are delayed. It, it is very difficult to make, you know, uh, to make sense out of it. So the, 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 the security threats are around because people are not safe in their mud box houses. <laughs> Do you understand? We cannot live in Soweto lifestyle in the Gambia during the days of apartheid. People are scared to move out. Every day you see news that somebody is killed there, somebody is stabbed there. What is happening? So I think we need to look at these things and make sure that the perpetrators are brought before the justice. Honorable Speaker. These are some of the things that need to be done in a quick you know, manner. Honorable Speaker, a new constitution. The president talked about new constitution. Very good. We welcome it. And we want it to be speedy. As 1997 constitution is not a progressive constitution with the time and age. The time that it was formulated, you can, I, I don't disagree with that, but the time that we live in now is not a progressive constitution compared to the other countries within the sub region. So holistically, we need to look at it. Though the draft constitution couldn't pass here due to so many factors at the time, political struggle, you know. So with all that, let's, let us all have a mind that Gambia needs a new constitution. And we want the president to work on this thing as quick as possible. He knows the modus operandi that they are going to use, and parliament will have a role to play. But we want Gambia to usher into third republic. That's the history of our president. That's our history as now. And that's the history of the Gambian people. Who is not interested in making a legacy?
tell me uh, in this house. So that's your legacy, that's my legacy, that's his legacy for Gambia to have a new constitution. Without that, we don't have a legacy. Honorable Speaker, fisheries, water resources. Honorable Speaker, we, we are informed here, one of the sonars, that boholes will not be an issue in this country. The number of boholes to be dug was stated clear, but up to now, go to Sare Adama or Kusalan or Sare Mound in, in, in is, it, is it upper flood? Lower flood. You cry with their cattle, go to center, Badibu, wire war, you have herds men with their cattle, they don't have water to drink. They have to migrate to the river rice to get water. And they, are, they have class with rice growers, farmers there. So once we don't find solutions to these problems, we'll be living in a state of problem. Conflict will be, will, will be obvious. So these boholes, Ministry of Fisheries need to be very serious with water, water, water problem in the rural Gambia. Water is a right. We need, it's a right to clean, safe water. It's our right. There is no M MP here. Maybe those in Bajul or where. But we are not happy with the water system in the rural Gambia. Upper Salu, you know, Nam, these days, the number of bohol that he inaugurated, he knows. Myself, I know. And these are from individuals who contributed to build these bowls. When we have a government who made a commitment that they will make water available to us. We know that the government cannot do all. That's obvious. But no more than be a coma. If I can get Jerem Fajel. Honorable Speaker, fishing. Um, we have these fishing centers in the Gambia, which are very common, and I believe they can supply us with with, with fish. You know, and there are projects. These projects, we are projects during PPP government, and API has inherited it. But there is no support to those. Fishing landing sites, Salikenye, Tankular, Tendaba, Kemoto, Albreda. This, this was a project inaugurated by the Italians. And this project can help us. The structures are there. We need the GS, the materials, the youths go for fishing. They need training too. Because some of those youths who are interested, they need training. So these materials need to be available to us. So, but you cannot expect, you give me. The, 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 the former government, APRC, had canoes, you could remember, or boats you might call them. Those boats were at Barra for so long. And they gave it to the youth or to some communities, but they don't have proper GS to do fishing. So this government, what is your commitment to fishing since you came? Oh, we came. What is our commitment to fishing? And the fishing agreements. The president did not talk about it. But I believe we need to revisit them. They are not in fine tune. Let's fine tune. Fine tune them. The fishing agreement with Senegal, the fishing agreement with the European Union and China, let's revisit them. Honorable, honorable Speaker, this is the tax of the Vice President. At the Cabinet, you really look at it, and we have a way out. I think it was done on Ross. Honorable Speaker, Coming to lands, local government, and religious affairs. Honorable Speaker, religion is my problem, and is a problem of many. In the sense, fanaticism is an increase. Intolerance becomes the order of the day. You have a right to believe in whatever you want. I have a right to believe in whatever, whatever I want. But that should not make you to hate me. That, would, that should not make you to force me to accept what you believe in. So we must fight against fanaticism because at the end of the day it will give birth to terrorism. Let's accept each other as Gambians. Believe in whatever you want to believe. Me, I'm not a, I'm not a preacher. If you are a preacher, preach in your mosque or in your church. Your preaching if in fact should not disturb me by law. So but what we are seeing in this country now is we become so intolerant. We don't tolerate people. 
and other issues you tolerate. If it is sports, you are a fan to Barcelona, and how many of them are Muslims? You support them, you, 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 you with your kaftan and everything, you go and watch them. So when I'm here, because of my belief, you don't want to sit with me. It must be stuck. It must be stuck. And we must have people as serious religious advisors. Because TRRC exposed a lot that some people use Islam as a blanket. They cover up themselves and commit serious problems in this country. And up to now, it's happening. So we must find solution to this. Constitution make it very clear. You have a right to worship, I have a right to worship. If I want, I can worship a tree. It's none of your business. That's my belief. So you have your belief. Do you understand? As an African, our culture is to tolerate. Honorable Speaker, Looking at the land, land becomes a problem. And we all know that um, we cannot do development without lands. And this land is high time government to look at it. Though some lands are owned by families, land tenure system, but the problems now are getting too much. We need to address them. Land ownership is a problem. And Government should de de decentralize the land policies to the rural Gambians. You go to the villages. In fact, even if you want to farm, you have a challenge to farm. Because of what? Land tenure system. There must be a system in place, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I will try to um, wrap up my speech, but I would like to um, read this part of this speech, which says, my government offers the nation a new socio-political order not tied to social preferences, partisan politics, or any form of ethnic. Honorable member, can you make reference so that members can follow? Page 54. The last speech of Sona. The president's speech. Is it the last speech? No, it's the same. No, please. Just go to the report. It's the same. Okay, it's the last page of Sona. Last page of Sona. It's not 54. Report. Yes. Look at your, that other one. Look at the last page. It's the same, it's the same writing. Page 62. Second paragraph. You get it? My government offers the nation a new socio-political order not tied to social preferences, partisan politics, or any form of extremism. This is a national order purely for patriotic service and development. I plead that we embrace it as a construct that calls for uprightness, sincerity, and diligence. I think these are powerful codings. It's very powerful and it's very touching. It should reflect in our action. It must reflect in our action. I thank everybody for your kind attention and I believe with this we are all committed. And what we are seeing here, let's minute and do work and leave a legacy, unless if you are not interested in a legacy. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member for Central Badibu. You, you've taken a better time, a better part of our time. But that is the purpose of the debate. Honorable Members, we tried to allocate time to the debate at the ABC meeting. But it was agreed that we leave it open for people to participate the way they want. I now, have, I now call on the Honorable Member for Janjambure. Thank, Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the floor. And by extension, I sincerely want to recognize the presence of 
the Vice President of the Gambia and his entire cabinet for taking up their time to also come and be with us in the parliament during this important um, engagements. Um, to start with Honorable Speaker, um, I just want to reflect on foreign affairs, international corporations and Gambians abroad. Um, looking at the speech of the President, um, few things that were not really reflecting in the speech was the issue of deportation in the country, which have been um, a great concern for our young people, both those that are living abroad and as well as within the country. And we think it will be very much important for this particular ministry to actually look at, look at the issue of deportation and also come up with policies that can help to address the means. Um, also, on the same issue that is on deportation, I think sometimes, yes, we cannot really deny some of our young people to come back to the Gambia, more especially if they are deported. But again, I think we should also look at the way they are integrated in our society. Um, some of these young people will come back home desperately from abroad, and at the end of the day, looking at the takeaway that they are given at the airport, it seems very, very little. And I don't think um, the funds that have been given to them can actually help to address their problems, looking at some of them actually coming from jails back home, some of them being arrested in streets and bringing them back home without actually having any financial muscles to actually start up new ventures in the country. So I really want to challenge um, the particular ministry to actually look into, into their situations. Also, um, our brothers and sisters in the diaspora, um, the president did mention about their contributions, that is, with regards to remittance. But again, um, I don't think we actually give them the actual rights or privileges that they, that they deserve, um, which were also cited by my colleague parliamentarians. Um, the right for them to exercise their franchise, I don't think is actually given to them. And it will be important for them to also reflect in our policy documents, wherein they can also realize some of the contributions they do across the country. Um, the President did mention about um, the Gambia holding a position with ECOWAS Commission. Yes, um, I think we also need to congratulate the ministry and the country as a whole. Um, also, with the issue of the Gambia being part of the United Nations Human Rights Council, that should actually last for three years, which is a term of an office. But then I think this should also help us to reflect on the issues of human rights in this country, because of recent, we have seen a lot of blockages from the IGP's office for restricting Gambians to actually go out in the streets to exercise their rights, more especially, what, more especially with issues that hinders their lives on a daily basis. Um, I also want to look at agriculture. The President did mention that the Gambia as a nation through the Ministry of Agriculture has actually made giant strides in transforming the agricultural sector. But um, I think some of this work seems to be more of politically motivated. If not, um, the actual statements that are kind of misleading because we cannot see statistics to actually inform us as parliamentarians as to some of the successes that have been realized in the agricultural sector. He has talked about um, um, growth in the poultry industry. He has talked about increase in, in the cereal sector. But again, I begin to ask myself, 
if actually there is an increase in cereal production, why are ordinary Gambians still struggling to buy a bag of rice for 1600 or a little more above, when actually our farmlands have been there for over three or four years without due completion? And looking at it, the excuses again are very flimsy, because sometime last week or two weeks ago, we embarked on a tour as a select committee on agriculture. And what we see on the ground were really disheartening. For example, a community we visited in the Upper River region, I think in the Woolies, looking at the distance that the community members walk to reach out to their farms, I think it's about three or four kilometers, which, looking at the nature of the feeder road, is really sad. And I want to challenge the Ministry of Agriculture to look at these areas and see where they can adjust. Because the excuses have been um, those projects were led by NEMA, and NEMA has faced out. I think it was a four or five year project for the Gambia, which was looking at to address the, the, the agricultural needs for our young people and women. But only to be told that um, the directors that were heading or leading those institutions died, and due to those reasons, um, those projects couldn't really forge ahead, or due to those reasons, those projects couldn't really realize their goals or objectives. And I wonder, are some of our institutions or offices meant for an individual? Because if you are telling me a director is not there, I will expect a deputy director to step in and continue on the good work that the former director was executing. But just to tell us director X die, director B die, and because of those reasons, the projects um, couldn't be successful. Um, we have, the president did also mention about the 294.13 million project that is ongoing, and I think that is being led by the Roots project. Um, looking at that project as well, I think the situation or the narrative still remains the same. Um, we have a whole of the River Gambia that is yet to be exploited. That is the potentials within the River Gambia to actually irrigate for farmers to cultivate on their farmlands seems not to be still realized. And I think the Ministry of Agriculture need to double up in addressing the issue of farming in this country. Um, also, in, 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 in his statement or in his speech, he talked about um, increase in the small ruminant sector. I think Tobaski was not, the last Tobaski we had in this country was not really 10 years ago. It was a few months ago. And ordinary Gambians were struggling to buy rams. And some of these rams, many would tell you, the borders were closed, more especially in between Mali and Senegal, and we cannot really get rams in the country. Therefore, the costs were, were high. And having these funds with the Ministry of Agriculture through their various sectors, I think they should be really invested. We really need to go down to the ground and work with the real farmers. We have farmers that are engaged in small ruminants. We see farmers in the various, in the various regions who, who would hold about, let's say, 20 or 30 ruminants. And before you go and support someone without a single good or a single ship, why not you go and develop or upgrade on that existing farmer on what he or she has? This is not happening, and I think this is how we should look at the realities on the ground by not deviating on the other hand. Um, also, I want to look at environment. I think a lot has been said on environment by the, by the, by the president, and we, 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 can, we can actually congratulate him through the government, or we can actually congratulate the government or the ministry through him 
for the Paris Agreement because they said we are committed to the international support to reduce emission. But again, if you look at our coastal lands, just I think yesterday or day before yesterday, I saw young people on social media, and these are young people from Khartoum protesting that they don't want a mining company in their community. But it seems we are giving deaf ears to some of those things. And the views of Gambians need to be respected at all costs. The mining companies are really distorting our environment, and I don't think we should continue to live in those situations. And also looking at um, the fish mills in this country, I think they are causing more damage than good on our coastal lines. And this particular ministry, that is the Ministry of Environment, really need to look into their operations and also come up with policies that will be environmentally friendly to help in addressing some of those, some of those challenges. Um, also, soil, salt intrusion in, in our rural communities is in the peak. Let's say from Nyanija down to Kuntau, salt has intruded those areas. And the reasons behind that, even though I'm not an environmentalist, I think one of the reasons is we have cut down most of our mangroves for one reason or the other, more especially with our local communities that would use mangroves to roof their houses. But again, you know, we cannot really stay in that blame game. What we should do is to resort to solutions wherein we can help to educate some of those um, community members to understand the importance of those mangroves in our waters. But again, I have not seen or heard from this particular ministry as to how much restoration project they have taken upon themselves in order to safeguard our environment. So therefore, I want to challenge the Ministry of Environment to also double up and ensure um, mitigation, mitigation measures have been put in place to help mitigate against environmental degradations. Um, even though they say there is an embargo on the issue of timber, I think it is still ongoing and we still have people in our respective communities with their chainsaws intruding our forest to cut down trees in order to sell and make money. But again, this is not only affecting our forest land. This means is also affecting our communities because it is trucks that have been used to go and collect some of these timbers, let's say from the forest parks or wherever one might call it, and those trucks also cause some soil damage on our environment. So therefore, I want to challenge the Ministry of Environment to double up and see how best they can mitigate some of these things. Let's look at the forestry department under the Ministry of Environment. When the Germans were in this country, annually they will be working with communities to restore the forest park. They were given seedlings for communities to engage on tree plantings. But of recent, not even of recent, over the past, when the Germans left the Gambia, that was the end of everything. You get into our forestry point of view. Honorable Speaker. Sorry, I don't think... Um, it's a point of order, please. Can we hear the point of order? Okay, I have yeah, it. Thank you. Honorable Speaker, I'm rising on order 31. 31 of the standing order. May I refer to assembly to 31, please? Yeah. So, basically, I, while we really appreciate the members' concern, but I think we should be devoted to the content of the speech. Uh, while I don't mean debate, uh, those narratives or details could be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Speaker. Go ahead, Honorable Member.
Thank you very much, um, Majority Leader. With all, um, with due respect, I think you walked out. You just came in, and it seems you are not okay with 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 the discussions. And sorry, and Honorable Speaker, um, I think I am on track, and I am speaking. Yes, so I think I just need to continue. It's better. Um, what I was trying to actually explain is we think the Department of Forestry should not only be engaged in issuing land scenes for people to go and chop down our forest park, but also they should be working with communities and respective structures to restore our environment for prosperity. Um, the is, I now want to look at the health ministry, which I think is also the backbone of this country, because without a healthy, without healthy people, we cannot really have um, a healthy nation or um, a prosperous nation. And during the president's statement, I just want to seize this opportunity to thank the ministry for the National Health Insurance Scheme scheme rather, which is a good step um, in the right directions. But again, as um, a colleague alluded, it will be also very much important for we to do the grassroots engagements because the narratives on social media seems to actually discourage or it might actually have effects on the process. So therefore, I think there should be more of um, engagements. Um, I have also heard, about, uh, heard from other colleague parliamentarians that with the community ambulances that were distributed, which I would say is more of an alternative to mobility, um, that might be okay with other constituencies, but I don't think this is a way to solve our problems. And I just want to give an example. That is um, the crossing points that actually connects the northern part of the Gambia and the southern part of the Gambia. And if I say the northern part of the Gambia and southern part of the Gambia, that is the crossing point. Specifically, I just want to look at the Central River region. We know for Janjambure crossing point, the ferry service there work on scheduled times. And at about 8 p.m. or 9 p.m., they close their doors for work. And patients from the north, let's say from Kuntau, Nyani, Same, and the like. Normally, if there are referrals to Bansang Hospital, you realize that, you know, it becomes a big challenge because an ambulance cannot cross with a boat. And therefore, I want to challenge the Ministry of Health to actually provide Janjambure Health Center with a functional ambulance that could be used as an alternative if in case the ferry service at Janjambure Crossing Point closed, then the ambulance at Janjambure Health Facility could come at the crossing point or at the jetty to help in taking a particular patient to Bansang Hospital. Um, I, 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 also want, I also want to look at youth and sports. Um, it was actually also reported by the president some of the progresses made around the youth sector and it seems what is being reported that is looking at the national youth scheme service that is to say over 150 young people were graduated by that satellite institutions yes um it was commended but again how much are some of these young people guided along the process, being it on career development or mentorship, to actually, to actually um, achieve their goals and objectives? Yes, I can be recruited by NYSS for one year program, and after that one year, I become jobless. So I think the career development needs to be adjusted in that aspect wherein our young people can attain to their dreams. And also, I think um, it's also important that to recognize the efforts of some of the international organizations, 
that were working within or around the youth fraternity in supporting young people to attend to their dreams. I think the approach needs to be slightly changed. The coordination around the implementation of some of these projects, being it GIS, that is the Take a Few project, being it IMVF, being it um, the Youth Empowerment Project, I think the government, through the Ministry of Youth and Sports, should adjust on their coordinations around the implementation of those funds in this country, wherein the ministry could actually help in directing us to how those investments should be done than allowing those international organizations to come and direct us to how um, those monies or those investments should be made. Um, also, I cannot conclude with youth and sports without actually registering my disappointment with the Honorable Minister. Here he is seated. Um, I think I was actually on social media to actually show my disappointment about him. Um, that was the allowance that were allocated to his wife, even though he was out there on the media to say it was an oversight, it was a mistake, he seek advice and Honor, all Honorable, Mem Honorable Speaker. And uh, I think um, speaker, the minister, point of, point of order, his action. Yeah, why was Honorable Mr. Speaker, Mr. yes, honourable member. Um, I still keep raising this thing, time without number. Um, let's restrict our intervention based on the speech given to us for Perusa. Someone's personal life or someone's defect. Okay, someone's defense. Yes, sir. Not personal. Personal. That's not personal. No, sorry. This is not personal. Speaker, can I be heard? Oh, my friend. So, uh, that's the correct. issue of the minister's travel to UK or, or to Commonwealth Games has never reflected in this thing. This issue could be raised at an adjournment debate. Please. So, Honorable Speaker, speak another point of order. Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker. Honorable speaker. You see, Honorable Member, when somebody please. is making a point of order, you please sit down. Suleiman. Sit down and then give the, give the person the opportunity to say it and there will be a ruling on it. Yeah. My, point of, yeah. my point of order is that what he's saying is actually new in the content of the speech. So, therefore, it could be reserved till adjournment debate and make that, that, that pronouncement. Thank you. Honorable yeah, uh, members, uh, for this particular one, I myself I have a concern because he's lamenting his concerns and regrets to the honorable member because he's seated. I mean, I think that is out of order, to be honest. You have a right to speak about issues as it pertains to whatever you call it, fraud or whatever. But in this specific issue, I think it's out of order. Honorable Speaker, um, let me rise again. And in response to what the Honorable just said, or in response to your ruling, I think the issue Honorable of... Honorable Member, you cannot comment on the ruling. Please, continue your debate. Or you well, I cannot it. continue on my debate without reflecting on the speech of the president. It is clearly stated by the president Honorable the success member, is once registered again, on the member, Commonwealth Games. So why member, are you denying me from speaking Honorable about it? Honorable member, please. I, in my opening remarks, I said, please, as much as possible, let's guide ourselves with our own rules. A ruling is made. Please continue. If you cannot continue, you please, uh, we give the floor to somebody else. Mr. Speaker, I will still continue and I will continue to speak about the allowance that were allocated to the minister's wife, which was public funds. Honorable and member, here, Honorable we, member, this is my last word to you, please, on this matter. The matter is ruled and you either take the floor or you continue your speech. This is my last one. Please. Honorable Speaker, no problem. I will rest my case on, on, on specifically 
on the minister seated here. But I will continue to say, corruption is at its peak in the Gambia, and the practices have been conducted by the executive, that is, ministers in this country. And we have been seeing it, sir. It is in the open. And here is the platform that we have to share our views, not only our views, but the views of the electorates. So if we should be condemned to speak about those trending issues that are affecting our daily lives, then I would still want to question the use of this August Parliament. Thank you, sir. I will continue. On tourism and culture, Honorable Minister, I will want to dilate um, on that. Um, it was reported that the Ministry of Tourism is actually exploring other avenues in order to diversify the tourism sector. But again, how much serious are we in our diversifications? Because if you talked about tourism diversification, it actually involves product development. And I want to ask, through you, Honorable Speaker, with new products or services have the Ministry of Tourism and Culture developed over the past year? And if you have an answer for me, kindly help, because I have a lot of interest around that industry. So therefore, what I want to put across is we really need to be realistic in our submissions. For the simple reason that a ministry cannot tell me that I want to diversify the tourism industry when actually, you know, you see nothing that has been happening in that diversification line. All that we sell for Destination Gambia is the three S, sun, sun, and sea. So if you are telling me you want to diversify, tell me what have you done in developing ecotourism in this country? Tell me what have you done in developing sustainable and responsible tourism in this country? Tell me what have you done in developing community-based tourism in this country. If such is done, then I can agree with the ministry that, yes, diversification is happening. But no, you go to that ministry, I think a petition is before this honorable parliament through the petition committee on the five ecologies that are supposed to be built across the country. And each region, is entitled to one ecology. The last time I visited Bara was last month. And sadly, go and see where they are building the ecology. Go to Jufre. Look at the jetty. Go to Jufre or James Island. Look at the heritage artifacts that are within those communities. It is really disheartening. If we want to diversify tourism, we really need to encourage our communities to take tourism upon themselves and let government support. But not government taking tourism upon themselves and expect communities to, take, to, to contribute. It wouldn't work. It cannot be a top-bottom approach. It has to be a bottom-top approach in order for we to reach there. The security port some of my colleagues have talked about it here yesterday. I wouldn't go that far in it. And I think at some point, as a member of the Tourism Select Committee, I will actually work with my colleagues to see as to how we can help in addressing that issue. Because, you know, it's not realistic for you to be paying a token when you are entering in your country or to pay a token when you are living in your country. Are we charged if we are entering in our homes, in our houses? No. Why did Gambia bring in such a tax on its citizens? Apart from that, the landing fees, we have seen how Senegal is growing. Just last year or two years ago, they inaugurated the new international airport. And it seems to be attracting a lot of airlines or tour operators to land at Senegal than the Gambia. Not because of any other reason. It's because the cost attached
to landing to the Senegalese airport is more favorable than the Gambia. We cannot be just hunting money. We cannot be hunters. We need to look at what will actually boost the economy of this country, what is more of realistic when it comes to developing tourism and culture. Honorable Member, can I observe? Yes. Honorable? Yes, please. Yes, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity. Uh, I just want to make a few clarifications just to clear the air. Um, but if you look at the security port, uh, it is paid in so many countries. Even uh, you get other subregions, you have it. But the manner in which it's collected, because the matter came before the Public Enterprise Committee, that it is physical class collection, that it can encourage fraud and corruption as well. So, but in other countries, when you go, it is embedded in your ticket where you pay it on the ticket. It is happening in so many countries. If we don't know, we have to. But you pay it in the ticket. But here it is collected physically. So that the, the, the arrangement, I think, needs to be looked at so that uh, it, it really can encourage fraud and uh, corruption. So this is our observation with respect to the board. Security. Honorable, thank you very much. Um, I know that very well. Yeah, give me to flow, please, if you don't mind. Please. Um, <laughs> horrible. Actually, I understand that very well. But the way and manners it is paid in other countries is not in the same way in our own country. And therefore, that shouldn't serve as a threat to our customers, knowing how much Gambia rely on tourism to boost our GDP. So therefore, I think... Um, that particular security levy needs to be looked into. I'm not saying we, dis we disband it, but what I'm trying to bring across here is there should be a way to collect that particular tax without customers feeling the pain. It's like daylight robbery. So moving forward, Honorable um, Speaker, I, 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 I really want to also looked at higher education, research, science, and technology. Um, the president did actually report on the infrastructural development in the country or the transformation, transformation phases that are happening around our higher education. And yes, at some point, you know, we are progressing. But in the other hand, we are not because we are not seeing some of these things as all-inclusive approach, more especially when the rural communities are left out. I think the only progressive institution we see around the rural communities is the Basel College. And sometime last month or two, they were crying of hunger. So the ministry really needs to adjust in creating institutions that can offer life skills and career developments to our young people. We should not see life skills as an alternative for our young people. We should actually mainstream it in our educational system. In Honorable order... Speaker, I want to observe. No, sir. Let's move. Honorable, relax. <laughs> um, Honorable Speaker, I want us to look at petroleum and energy. I think the cost of petroleum in this country, let's say per liter, is really threatening. And I think last week or sometime last week, um, the ordinary citizens were really suffering. That is the movement of people from one place to the other, simply because the transport union were on a protest. And I think this can be avoided. And as such, I also want to challenge the Petroleum and Energy Ministry to also look into some of these prices and see where we can have a cut and also make fuel as affordable as we can. If other countries are selling fuel, let's say for 45 or for 65 dollars, when Gambia we are selling it for 75 dollars, then if you are not careful, more especially with our commercial drivers, they might not end up sympathizing us. And people like us from the rural communities, <laughs> we can only make a need 
when actually we travel to the greater Banyul area, you will come to realize that we will still continue to suffer and suffer and suffer, more especially the poor communities. Um, Honorable Speaker, um, before I would take my seat, I would also want us to look at gender, children, and social welfare. Um, the President actually have spoken around the Disability Act that he says was in force. But again, I want us to actually expedite the process. Yes, sometimes we have some of these acts, especially in the Gambia, um, we're good in formulating policies. We're good in formulating acts. But again, do we reflect on them? It's always a question. And I would definitely appreciate if the said ministry can actually look into the issues of our children in this country. Because it seems on a weekly basis you will hear a news about a missing child. So I think there should be um, a data system that would actually help to register the names of these children in our systems and also to ensure that their welfare have been safeguarded. Um, legal, I would also want to say one or two things about it as well because um, I know a lot was invested. A lot was invested on the TRRC, which was actually approved by this Honorable Parliament. But it seems that the issue continues to drag. For example, with the white people. I would also want to challenge the Ministry of Justice to also look into avenues to expedite the process because we have victims out there who have been waiting to see what their compensations shall be and until now they cannot actually establish their fate. Therefore, I would actually want to challenge the Honorable Minister and his ministry to expedite some of these processes. And also in our justice system, like I think um, it will be also important to find possibilities. I know they have been trying to decentralize the justice system, having, let's say, courthouses in every region. But again, we think some of the regions in the Gambia are not being considered. And even if we have a judge, they are not staying with us. We only see them periodically if there are cases they are supposed to preside over. So therefore, we think every region should have an established and functional courthouse that would look at cross-courting issues, being it the High Court, the Magistrate, the Chilean Court, you name it. I think we should graduate from just having everything centered in the Greater Banyul area and also see as to how we can expand some of these things in our rural communities and also be able to serve, to serve the rural communities. On that note, once again, Honorable Speaker, I want to seize this opportunity to thank you for giving me the floor. And also, I want to thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Honorable Member for Janjambure. Honorable Members, as I said earlier, we will stay today to finish the, the other paper for today. And uh, we're going very slowly, a lot of repetitions. I will want to urge all those who have spoken also to stay and listen to those who are here to speak. We now have the Honorable Member for Busumbala. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the floor. I 
acknowledge the presence of uh, the Vice President of the Republic of the Gambia and his ministers here present. I also extend my gratitude and thanks to the people of Usumbala constituency in whose mandate I stand before this August Assembly and address uh, and take part in the debate of the SONA. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I want to start my intervention in the area of legal sector. But before doing that, Honorable Speaker, I want us to look at um, introductory remarks of the President when he came and read his State of National Address. In that remark, Honorable Speaker, the President did inform us that Gambia is a transformed nation. I want us to look at this um, term very critically. Gambia is a transformed nation. Honorable Speaker, in order for the nation to be termed as a transformed nation, there are criteria. And when we look at those criteria, we can say it, whether Gambia is a transformed nation. Honorable Speaker, a transformed nation is a nation that the government gives the subject voice and pop. Honorable Speaker, whether this country, the Gambia, our government is giving the people there, the subject, that voice and hope. Honorable Speaker, we'll also look at another criteria, that is a transformed nation established a vision, established a vision for the future and the roadmap of journey towards the direction of better improvement and development of this country. Honorable Speaker, can we say it at this point in time, a Gambia is a transformed nation when we have a problem with our national development plan. As far as I know, I have gone through these uh, statements. I have not come across with any statement by the President made mention of national development plan. Honorable Speaker, I will not call a nation a transformed nation, wherein you have remained prisoners at central prison, going for court and staying in that prison for 14 years. <coughs> Honorable Speaker, we have come across uh, during our rollout at mile two, a remind, the longest serving remained prisoner served 14 years in that prison and while still going to court. That is sad. You cannot set a country a transformed nation if you have remained prisoners staying for 14 years in jail. Honorable Speaker, you cannot call a nation a transformed nation if the victims who have been suffering for more than 20 years are still wallowing in their pains without remedies. Honorable Speaker, you cannot call a nation a transformed nation if you are having those problems. Honorable Speaker, you cannot call a nation a transformed nation if the, sea, uh, if the security um, airport security fee levy is being collected without table before deputies at the National Assembly. Honorable Speaker, if you look at uh, section 149 of the Constitution, did clearly state that any taxation, any taxation that need to be imposed by that need to be imposed by the government of this country should find its ways at the National Assembly for approval. Let's ask ourselves whether the airport security port fee is being tabled before this assembly. I haven't seen it in any record. So you cannot oh, call oh, a nation... Hon Honorable Member, can you make reference to the section of the Constitution? 149, section 149 one of the Constitution. 149. 149 of the Constitution. Honorable Member, section 149. 
Why are you repeating this? Okay, yes. Honorable Speaker, point of order. No. Point of order. Yes, Honorable Member. Section 30, subsection 1, uh, clause 1 is very clear. The member is deviating from the, from the address. What he is talking about is not even within the address of, of the President. Oh, Levis, Honorable Member, can you continue, please? Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. I appreciate that. <laughs> Honorable Members, let us be serious. This thing we are saying is not personal. It's for our country. Let us be serious and proceed for the betterment of this country. We cannot have a taxation that, been, that has been imposed on our people, and they are paying it. And that taxation is causing a lot of money. It depriving the government a money that should be used for your other projects, your road development, uh, your road construction. You know, a money that you should be used that should be used for educational purposes to educate our children. A money that you, that should be used to make sure that you know we equip our police officers with vehicles to make sure that they. Uh, they, they serve effectively. Please, let us be serious, you know. All right. Honorable, uh, honorable Speaker, like I'm saying, that transformation is a dream that the President just read, but I think we should try and transform it to reality. I'm saying we are yet to attain that status of uh, transform nation so let's work together and make sure that you know hence is a dream that has been written and he read it we try and attend to that status point of observation point of observation okay thank you honorable the point of observation is a very sensitive matter as the issue of the prisoners you raise it's unbearable that some of the prisoners are in prison for 14 years, are in detention centers for 14 years. And this matter, as National Assembly members, we should look into it critically and stress over the issue because that alone is a human rights violation. I don't know what type of democracy do they normally preach about <laughs> time and again. Thank you. Point of observation. Thank, thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, as I said, I will start my intervention. Honor, honor, honorable Member, please just hold on. Honorable Members, we must differentiate between a point. If a member gives you a point of uh, observation, it means you are observing something. And a point of observation is not for you to make a statement. Let's note that, please. Honorable Member, you can continue. So, Thank so, you, Honorable Speaker. Sorry, Honorable Member. May I please observe? I just want to make a real clarification, please. Thank you, Honorable Member, for Bozumbala. I mean, what I just want to observe is with regards to the issue of the security port. You did mention that it is taxation, and as such, you cited Section 149 of the Gambia Constitution. There's a difference between taxation and a levy and a fee. The security port is not a taxation. It's a fee. Taxation is based on income, which you might generate from the sales of your properties, which you might generate from the sales of your merchandise, or based on an income that you have generated after the delivery of a service. This one is separate. It's a contractual agreement between the government and a service provider. And as such, it is not taxation. So, thank you for giving thank me. Thank you very much, Honorable. Honorable, I think uh, in any service that you plunge into and you're making money and you paid part of that money to the government is a taxation. I still believe to be corrected, but I know 
when you make money and you paid part of that money to the uh, government covers, it's a tax. It's a taxation. So, Honorable member, a second observation, please. Honorable. Yeah, and, and, uh, to add on to what he has said, I think the government itself called it airport tax. Yes. So I don't know why that no nomenclature airport tax if it is not a tax. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable members. Uh, honorable, honorable members. Point of uh, correction, please. Sir. Honorable members. I want to clarify. Honorable members, please. Honorable members, I think what the nominated you know, member honorable, did say, is you made reference to a provision of the constitution. And it's making clear that provision relates to taxation. And that taxation is what, what, how it is defined. Honorable so Speaker. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know whether we are clear about the issue. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I read that yes. section and the subsection they are in, and I know what they are taxing. It's an airport tax. No. What they are what they are collecting from our brothers and sisters from Europe once they landed in our airport is taxation is benefiting this government. Honorable Speaker, it's going to government coffers. Honorable Speaker, we sorry, please. I'm not I'm not giving you I, I'm I, not giving you the we, no. no honorable members on, uh, honorable members. I think I think honorable members. Let's get this very clear. Honorable members, please. Honorable members. Honorable member, please. Honorable members, we must exercise tolerance. We must listen. And we must go by our own regulations as much as possible. You look at somebody commenting. It does, it does, let's be responsible, please. This is an important institution that we are serving. We must protect its integrity and we must not allow it to be put into this report. By what? By our own behaviors. And some of you hammered on the issue, what the president said, from, from put aside our political differences and come together. That's what you were hammering on. People had opinions on it. People thought it differently. People said it should start somewhere. That's the beauty of democracy and what we are doing. But we must respect each other's opinion. Honorable member, please. You know, this te technical issue, you quoted the Constitution. You know, you have right to say what you are saying. Is the, is the amount people are paying, you are not in agreement. Or it should be done so differently. You have the right. But when you attack it to a provision of the Constitution that people have differences, it must be made clear. Please, you can continue, please. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, like I said, I will make my intervention in the area of the legal sector, uh, like in tandem with the address of the President. <laughs> Honorable Speaker, at times I'm concerned about the human rights records, the, which this new constitution could have been addressed, uh, but uh, for some reason we still have some, several provisions in our law books that curtail our freedoms to attainment of those rights. Uh, that's why I will challenge the Minister of Justice to make sure that, you know, he fast tracked and come brought, uh, if fast track and bring before this National Assembly the draft constitution. And when we said bring this draft constitution before the National Assembly, we don't want to see that, you know, because I'm very much careful the way the statement has been read uh, to craft in a such a way that we lose most of the fundamental provisions in that constitution. One of those provisions is uh, like the issue of nominated members. Uh, in the new draft constitution, it has been very clear there. So 
the reason why I am saying this honorable, uh, honorable speaker, because at times you can see, uh, I, I don't still believe it is democracy. When you, say, when you sit and see nominated members being appointed as speaker and the deputy speaker of the house, whilst you leave the elected members here, you know, we are representative of the people. We, we, went, we went to our communities and conversed votes while some of you nominated members are sitting at your offices. All of a sudden brought before us and appointed as speakers and deputy speakers. That should not be accepted. <laughs> Honorable Speaker, Honorable Speaker, in, in that uh, draft constitutions, Please, I'm saying all members here, the draft constitution is here to enable us that we have a full powers. Among those powers is make sure that, you know, to put these ministers into a proper scrutiny before they access our ministerial position. We all know that there are allegations here and there, a lot of corruption at the ministries, but when we have those power to make sure that we scrutinize a minister before National Assembly and that scrutiny will expose that minister and show that you know the, the, the members of the general public will know this minister is Mr. This minister is so is capable to handle this particular position. This minister is having these assets before acquiring this position. This minister is having this knowledge, skills, and know-how to make sure that he propel this ministry to the highest level. So all these are opportunities that can be found in that new draft uh, constitution. So if the president is telling us that he's working with the minister concerned, that is the minister of justice, to make sure that you know that document is brought and tabled before the deputies, we should celebrate that, not only celebrating it, but we should welcome it and tell the minister concerned we want this thing to be here before us uh, as soon as possible. All right. All right. Like I said, we have so many human rights friend, uh, human right on friend provisions in our constitutions that on our status book that restrict movement of our citizens. One among these is Section 5 of the Public Order Act, and we should look at this thing very critically. Section 5 of our Public Order Act did state that, you know, before citizens will go and demonstrate, they must have obtained permit from the Inspector General of Police. But now, look at what led to the uh, April 10 and 11 student demonstration, 2000 student demonstration. They did apply a permit from the Inspector General's office. He denied it. And the student went out and protest. Look at what unfold, un untold stories now we, we are facing in this country. So many students lost their life. Most of the students, uh, some students lose their life during the process. Some are incapacitated, you know, they cannot, they cannot walk from one place to another without using wheelchair. All, all those are caused by these provisions that are not human rights friendly. So we should try and make sure that we remove those laws from our status quo. And also, this section five of the Constitution continue to haunt us. If I say that we look at the Soros and this case, you know, and we are still witnessing the Inspector General of Police using that section to deny people who wanted to go out and pr protest. Please, let us make sure that, you know, we change our law, our status book, and give citizen a better provisions that will safeguard and protect their fundamental freedoms and for their fundamental rights. Uh, having said that, um, we also 
register some success in the area of um, in the area of access to information bill which is tabled before you the deputies in the fifth legislation i must acknowledge and thank you people for taking that bold step and uh, give us that law which enable the journalists now to access those information but having said that we still have some provisions that curtail this freedom of you know accessing justice uh, accessing information because we have you know uh, cpcs uh, criminal procedure courts we have uh, this giving false information to public officers you know giving false information these are laws draconian laws that have been used to make sure that you know the they, they prosecute peoples in this country. One among them uh, is, yeah, these are uh, economic crimes. All these are laws in existence. So we should make sure that uh, we engage or challenge the Minister of Justice to make sure that, you know, we have a provisions that are human rights friendly in our law books to avoid being... Um, subject of suppression when you comes to exercise sin our human rights issues. Honorable Speaker, that will be my intervention for in the area of just uh, legal. But then before closing, before going to another areas, still in legal, Honorable Speaker, you will be very much uh, shocked to hear this, but this is what happens, you know. In so many cases, when you go to a remind prison, you will find people there who are staying there more than three to four months, five months, without appearing before the court. The practice will be, if you are charged for an offense which is attract capital punishment, they will mention it at the magistrate court, transfer the case at the high court, and reminded the accused person at central prison, mile two. And the case file will be sent to AG chambers for an advice, and that case file will stay in that office for more than two, three, four months, up to six months. I have witnessed it, and I know people who are suffering on that account. So we are seeing the Minister of Justice should act and do better to make sure that, you know, people have a uh, quick justice. And also, Honorable, uh, Honorable Speaker, now I'll move to my favorite area, that is security. Uh, Honorable Speaker, security should be everybody's concern or business in this country. When you look at the Interior Ministry, Honorable Speaker, it will be interesting to know that when Human Rights Committee left roll out for their function, committee functions, we went to Bara. Bara, the prisoner's ransom that the prisoners are entitled. That reason I learned from our colleagues, the sixth leg uh, fifth legislation, they said there was an incre increment on the budget so that the prisoners could be catered for. But then when you go there, you interact with the station officer, they will tell you they, will, they have never received a butoot to feed those prisoners. And you cannot confine someone curtail his freedom of movement without providing food to that individual. Let's put him and face into this. It's bad. So we are, we are asking the Minister of Interior to make sure that you engage your commissioners, your IDP down to the commissioners. If these rations are given to them, let it filter to the relevant authority, that is the station officer, so that those in the prison or those in the cell or detention facilities can enjoy this 
fruit because it's their money. All right. Honorable Speaker, it will also interest you to know that mobility is another constraint that the police officers face. But these are very difficult to defend it because if the police are facing that constraint, and you can see the IGP voluntarily, you know, rendering a public service to the pedestrian, that gives a conflicting issue as to whether you can support them or you can advocate for them. Because there is uh, this um, uh, driver's situation that went on pro protest. Among all the security sectors, departments, it's only the Inspector General of Police who volunteer to give his uh, uh, bans to ease that transportation. So meaning, you don't have a pickup in Barra, you don't have a pickup in Farafini that will be able to transport prisoners together with remind prisoners from Farafini to Janjambri, but you can, you can give a pretty, um, passengers a ban for easy movement when the, 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 the drivers went on strike. So these are some of the things in order for Ross to advocate for the police to have those uh, in person and equip them with the, with the materials needed, they also has to be like, you know, act professionally. You know, you cannot act to please the executive when your house is not in order. Mr. Uh, Honorable Speaker, in the area of uh, steel at the police, Honorable Speaker, we ask Kexon from the police officers that we came interface with, interaction, and some of the police officers will tell you, the committee members are here, over 10 years Honourable, they were not supplied with... Honourable, can I observe you, please? Honourable, thank you very much. I know you went on a tour, your committee. I want to make a special appeal to you. Some of the things that you have seen during your committee since the report is not ready, can you paraphrase them or you summarize them not to go in detail until the report is completed? Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Honorable. But I think these are important issues and these are issues that are affecting my own people, that's the police, and there is no better place to address it rather than here because the president, the, the president made mention of it. You know, security. All right. But honourable member, I think the honourable member for Central Badibu may be right. Don't preempt your. If it is a report, a committee report, you don't preempt it until it's stable and presented to plenary. Uh, honourable Speaker, thank you very much. I can say it without taking reference from the talk. But then these are some of the things uh, I personally witnessed, and I have also lived in it, live under this condition. So I have a personal experience of it. All right, then let's go to still on the security uh, interior. Let's see the Department of Immigration, Honorable Speaker. Immigration is established to make sure that uh, they perform certain functions for the citizen of this country. In the president's speech, I have seen that uh, immigration, uh, the interventions of immigration here is basically uh, the money that, are, that they have collected to add up to our revenue. We thank immigration department for this, uh, you know, contribution, but then we will challenge them to do better in the area of securing our national documents. You know, of recent, so many public uh, outcries has been in the medias that um, foreigners are having access to our national document. So we will challenge the, uh, the head of immigration department to be courteous and be cautioned about some of those activities.
Honorable Speaker, we now go to drug control, drug law and enforcement, NDA. Honorable Speaker, this is one area that uh, we should register excellence because the director of that uh, institution has been there for more than uh, five years to six years now or above or more than that. So, but we have seen in this country wherein, you know, the uh, drug will be seized, you know, in certain areas like the the, the famous drug the famous drug seizures that was done at the seaport our, our, our seaport and uh, we want to challenge the inspector the the interior minister to tell us this bantakita that has been a talk of who is this bantakita because still it's over one year that people cannot know who is bantakita you know so also uh, also in the in that area will challenge honorable the drugs speaker. honorable speaker honorable speaker, speaker. Yeah, is it point, is there a point of order yes yes minority point of order Can we hear? I, I want to observe my my colleague that the matter of the national drug law enforcement agency regarding bantaketa is before the court of law and any matter before the court of law should not be part of the parliamentary deliberation thank you minority sustained uh, minority leader uh, I still believe uh, anyway but I still believe this bantakita should be honorable member please when there is a ruling you cannot go over it uh, learn to abide by the laws of the land please honorable speaker with due respect I will but it's my opinion you cannot express an opinion here when there is a ruling honorable speaker I honorable will honorable member please opinion. sit down honorable member please sit down honorable Kante. Honorable member, please sit down. Honorable members, I have said it over and over. We are guided here by laws. Some of those laws are pre we are prepared by ourselves. You don't have opinions on those. You are, we are all guided by those laws. There is a point that we are made to understand and it's sustained, and it's true. You cannot comment on it. You cannot go go ahead with your with your with your debate, please. Is that what you want? Okay, please go ahead and continue your debate. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I will look at the area of. Uh, agriculture. Honorable Speaker, the President made mention of a huge amount of fund that has been directed to the advancement of agricultural productivity in this country. Honorable Speaker, we challenge the Minister responsible for agriculture to make sure that, you know, those projects uh, reflect, you know, those projects reflect uh, the development and aspirations of farmers in our rural Gambia. Honorable Speaker, if you go down to CRR, to URR, you will realize that Gambia did not lack the fields uh, where we can make a mass production of rice and other related agricultural productivity. But what we lack is the expertise. We did not even lack the expertise. You have so many doctorate degree holders in the field of agriculture, but what we lack is transparency and accountability in the field of agriculture. And we will challenge the minister responsible for agricultural agriculture to make sure that he deploy people of 
higher caliber and integrity to be, monitor to be monitors and also project coordinators in those areas so that the benefit can be felt uh, realized in our rural Gambia agricultural productivity uh, productions. Honorable Speaker, I'll also move to the Office of the Vice President. Honorable Speaker, of recent, we all realized that uh, Gambia is hit by a flood, and that flooding has caused so many homes, left so many homes in devastated stage. Uh, Honorable Speaker, we have seen during that moment um, step that has been taken by the government of this country uh, in the case of Jabang uh, disaster victims, which is unfortunate. I would call it very inhuman to intervene in that manner to destroy homes and houses of individuals who are residents of that uh, ex-state. And besides, Honorable Speaker, I will put it very clear, those victims did not make themselves a victim. You know, those victims acquire this land through a process and procedures that are legal. Those victims, to remind this honorable speak, to remind uh, this honorable August gathering, those victims were allocated that land through a social security. And as far as I know, social security is a department within the Gambia government purview. So, if somebody should be blamed for blocking the water, uh, water to blocking the waterways in that area, it should be physical planning, the uh, physical planning, which is uh, uh, and, 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 and social security, who allocated the land, and the approval was given to them by the physical planning for that area to be a residential place. And Honorable Speaker, under the Office of the Vice President, we have, seen, we, we have this uh, disaster management agency. Again, this disaster manage management agency should be very much uh, proactive in assessing, assessing uh, disaster occurrence and disaster victims so that they can give uh, remedies timely, but in doing so, Honorable uh, Speaker, they should also restrain from being political in their doing and their actions. The reason why I say that, Honorable Speaker, we all live in witness when COVID-19 hit this country heavily. I, we are all victims of COVID-19 here. You can see the, distribution, the distributors of those uh, rice will come and jump compounds because they, they, they are perceived to be an opposition. So those things did not help a nation. We are trying to build a nation. So our actions as public officials should reflect the, uh, the, the, the core values of transparency, integrity, and uh, honesty. Honorable Speaker, in the area of youth and sport, we must uh, commend the sector for registering success that happens during these five years. Uh, they have performed tremendously well in the area of sporting and uh, other youth engagement activities. We have seen so many projects, international projects, that are geared towards empowering youths, and uh, which also create some, or have effect, and uh, positive effect on the, on the youths of this country. Uh, Honorable Speaker, we have been said that uh, we should also uh, look at the conduct of the the ministry, and we will advise our our honourable minister to make sure that uh, you know 
the, the, the incident that happens did not repeat itself. Honorable Minister, look at gender children and gender children and social welfare. Uh, Honorable Minister, this is uh, one of the areas that I want to advocate to Point make of sure order. that. Point of order. Can we can we hear the point of order, Member for Sabah? Yes, thank you, Honorable Speaker. Um, all speeches uh, in the assembly should be addressed to the uh, speaker and not to ministers. What's your point? Yeah, yes. that is in order. Mm. Honorable member, please address me. Honorable speaker, I think I'm addressing you. <laughs> All right. Honorable speaker, okay, let's look at gender children and social welfare. Honorable Speaker, uh, this is the area that I really want to make sure that, you know, the intervention to be very critical and clear so that we can see our women as partners in development. Honorable Speaker, Looking at the current position of our, our cabinet, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't look to be gender, it doesn't look to be, you know, very fair to women. We only have uh, two or three representatives at the cabinet. Now, because the president did make mention of it, I will challenge the president to make sure that next time he include more women in our cabinet positions so that uh, the palace can be here. Honorable, honorable Speaker, I also challenge security chiefs to make sure that you know, they promote more women uh, at the helm of affairs of our security so that they can also take command positions and make sure that, you know, because they are afraid with the issues that affect women. So taking them into that position will, be else, will also enable them to have that understanding and the know-how as to how they will treat women. Honorable Speaker, also on the gender, children and social welfare, Special attention should be given to children with special needs. Honorable Speaker, we challenge this ministry to make sure that they, you know, they engage government in all sectors to make sure that component of these, you know, um, people with disabilities to have an employment. With that, we'll avoid people begging on the street. With that, we'll avoid people being sympathized on the street. And with that, we'll raise the dignity and uh, integrity of people with these special needs. Honorable Speaker, I would also like to make some intervention in the area of uh, Tourism and uh, tourism and culture. Honorable Speaker, like the other speaker rightly alluded, Honorable Speaker, certain statements are derogative and should not be made, particularly targeting people from a specific country who are one time our masters. You know, uh, women have right to choose and to decide who to go to bed with. Women should have right to come to any country and find a husband of their choice. It should not be a national discussion or, or ministerial or even a departmental subject matter to 
throw those uh, derogative remarks in that particular areas. We do that, we are going to make sure, we, we will be losing our tourist sector, and we believe tourism contributed, you know, in our revenue collection. Honorable Speaker, I also want to talk about our brothers and sisters, the diasporans, who time and again were seen contributing positively towards the growth and development of this country. Honorable Speaker, I would say it without our brothers and sisters who are in diaspora, most people in this country will be in a pain, sorrow, because the family dependency in this country is skyrocketing. But then with their intervention, more, you know, more, more, more concentration is lies on them than people who are residing in this country. So acknowledging them by the president for their contribution towards the national development, towards the uh, 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 revenue collection is uh, very commendable uh, and welcomed. Honorable Speaker, we look at the petroleum and energy. Honorable Speaker, I think I can talk about this because the matter is out from the court. <laughs> Honorable Speaker, um, we have a case here in the gun petroleum case, and the accused persons were acquitted and discharged. Uh, Honorable Speaker, this is a case that allegedly a lot of funds has been siphoned or been pocketed into private pockets. Honorable Speaker, we want the government to uh, look at this case very critically and if possible to reinvestigate and know because uh, as far as the matter, the accused persons were discharged at the court, uh, we want thorough investigation into this matter. So we challenge the Inspector General of Police to take note and the Interior Minister. Honorable Speaker, in the area of education, like several speakers have alluded, when we said education, we cannot only talk about you know, the professional education, but we, we, we should also make sure that you know, we look into the training facility, training centers, you know, to decentralize these training centers in various regions, various constituencies, so that people who are not fortunate enough to pass their exam, to have enrollment in universities and tertiary institutions can be, you know, uh, can have admission into these training schools and can learn skills that is all going to enhance development and productivity of this country. Honorable Speaker, probably my last intervention will be in the area of health. Honorable Speaker, over the years, for the five, 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 uh, five, past five years, we have seen several NGOs that are set up to make sure that they partake in the health management system in this country. One notable amongst them is the is the uh, Gambia Women's Life Matters. Honorable Speaker, I think these uh, 
particular NGO is doing a great job for the country. We are all witness to that. So I'll urge the Minister of, uh, Minister of uh, Health to make sure that uh, he work with uh, these like-minded NGOs to make sure that, you know, we bring, uh, we at least, you know, empowers them to help them in the process, show that what they are doing can be, you know, realized and felt by the women who are in these uh, situations. Because we have seen several occasions when the women are at the delivery point, they lack uh, blood, they will make a communication, fast communications, you know, through social medias, and within a short period of time, they will have a response, and people will go and donate blood to the particular woman in pain. So we'll urge the Minister of, Inter uh, Minister of Health to have a close working relationship with these NGOs and see them as partners in development, but uh, not in other way around. Honorable Speaker, several speakers have lamented uh, the number of funds that has been deployed into the Minister of Health uh, during COVID-19 and, COVID and, and, and up to this time, we, we need to see results because our health sector in this country is definitely um, a point of concern. Honorable Speaker, the health facilities. I, I don't want to make mention of my uh, constituency because of, uh, for some reason, but the health facilities in this country need to be upgraded to major hospitals. You know, the health facilities situated at Banjulunding need to be, pro uh, need to be you know, upgraded because of the catchment areas that it serves. The health facilities at Yundum need to be upgraded to major hospital status because of the catchment areas it serves, like Busumbala, the biggest village within my constituency, you know, is without a health facility, they always fall back to that of um, Yundum. Honorable Speaker, uh, with these interventions, I beg to take my seat and thank you for giving me the floor. Thank you very much, Honorable Member for Busumbala. Honorable Members, it seems memories fade easily sometimes. Uh, because most of us, if you remember, sometime we are members of either the civil or the public service. We've gone to, after two, from morning to now, we have just dealt with three, three only three members contributed. And we still have about 30 other members to contribute. And that today is the last day for the debate. We must stay to finish. So I'm honorable members must know that. Equally, those who have spoken and we are listened to by honorable members must also stay to listen to others when they speak. Uh, on that note, I, I, will, I will suspend the sittings for an hour for us to go for lunch and pray. Uh, observation it is, it is for Honorable Speaker, I have an observation before you rule that out, please. Please. Who, who is making the observation? Honorable Sabak Sanjal. Sabak Sanjal. Yes, please, please, please. Yes, Sabak Sanjal. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you, Honorable Speaker. I just have an observation before you adjourn. Um, deep on on uh, the standing orders um, 61, debate of motions and amendments. I am suggesting that the Assembly Business Committee should sit over this matter whilst we are on break. Because if you look at Standing Order 61, subsection 2 is saying the Assembly may 
on a motion made by the Assembly Business Committee in accordance with this standing order impose a limit in respect of debate or any particular motion or bill by alluding a limited period of time for such debate or by limiting the time during which members may speak. So I'm suggesting that they should at least suggest a particular time for, for the debate so that we can conclude. You Thank move. you Thank very you. much, you Honorable move. Member, for Sabak. Honorable Member, I have said it at the ABC meeting, I did raise the issue of trying to put a time limit. And members there then said, no, let's leave it open. Now we are here, others have contributed openly. It will be difficult to restrict others. So we must all be at the brunt to stay here to finish. Uh, all what we need to do is, let's as much as possible avoid repetition upon repetition. So honorable members, uh, it's already going half past two, it's 25 after. The stop, I will suspend the session. The assembly stands suspended until 15.30, when we should all come back to resume business again. So the assembly stands suspended until 15.30.